Hello, and welcome to our program on the most important economic trends for the U.S. in 2022. I'm Colby Smith, the U.S. Economics Editor at the Financial Times, and I'm joined by Jan Hatzius, Chief Economist at Goldman Sachs and head of the firm's Global Investment Research Division. Before we begin our discussion today, um, just a quick disclaimer to note that the Council is an independent and nonpartisan organization and takes no institutional policy positions. So the views expressed by participants in the program today are their own. Second, in about 30 minutes, I will be opening up the discussion to audience questions. So if you would like to ask one, please enter ccga.live into your browser and follow the on-screen prompt. There you'll be able to submit um, a question or vote for your favorite one. Um, so Jan, we're so thrilled to have you uh, with us today to talk about uh, your outlook for the economy, the trajectory for inflation, the labor market, uh, Fed's monetary policy. So thank you for joining us. So good to be here. Thank you for having this discussion. Look forward to it. Me too. Um, so lots to, lots to cover, um, as uh, I alluded to in the, in the intro here. Um, next week, we have the central bank meeting for its uh, first time in 2022. And a lot has changed since their last gathering in December, uh, when officials uh, seemed uh, open to the idea of three interest rate increases for 2022. But before we dive into all of those specifics, I wanted to begin um, with a couple questions on the labor market, since that has most recently been, you know, the sticking point for a lot of Fed officials in determining whether the economy was on firm enough footing uh, to kind of proceed with uh, tighter monetary policy. And December's jobs report gave us a lot to kind of uh, work off of, and we saw the unemployment rate fall below 4%, um, and yet there's still roughly 3 million or so fewer positions uh, today than there were uh, you know, prior to the pandemic. So given this economic backdrop, I, I'm wondering how much spare capacity you do see in the labor market um, at, at this point in time. It's a great question and it has been absolutely key, I think, to how a lot of Fed officials have thought about the timing for, for liftoff, because after all, we've had above target inflation for, for quite a while. But as recently as six months ago, I think there was still a view that we were quite far away from, from maximum employment, the ambitious criterion that has been set in the, in the FOMC statement for, for liftoff. And I think even now there's a fair amount of uncertainty because you've got a pretty broad range of indicators in terms of what they say about where we, where we are. We're still, as you said, uh, uh, you know, very far, more than 3 million uh, positions before, below the pre-pandemic level. The overall employment to population ratio is still very far below pre-pandemic. At the same time, the unemployment rate's below 4% and indicators like, for example, quits or job openings or the percentage of households that say jobs are plentiful rather than hard to get. I mean, those all look like something that is consistent with full employment, maybe even beyond full employment. So there's a large number of indicators to choose from. Uh, yeah, what we can certainly say is that we're significantly closer than we were six months ago because there's been a large amount of improvement in, in most of these indicators. Our best guess is that we're probably not yet at literally maximum employment but we're not too far and we'll get there within, within the next you know, several months or in the, in the first half of the, of the year. So that certainly makes it, even in, the, in, in terms of the Fed's own very ambitious criterion, more, uh, you know, a lot more realistic that you would see uh, you know, lift off in the, in the funds rate and, and a move towards normalization. Absolutely. And um, one of those laggards, though, is the participation rate. That's something that we, we hear quite often from the Fed. And, and even as recently as, you know, early last year, uh, Chair Powell was saying, you know, we need to look beyond the unemployment rate and focus on participation to get a better sense of, of where we are at in terms of this recovery. Um, and I, I'm curious if you do think that participation rates will, um, you know, return to their pre-pandemic uh, level, as well as the trajectory kind of set prior to the pandemic in terms of improvements on that front, or if there have been, you know, real structural changes in the labor market 
since the onset of the pandemic that mean that we need to kind of rethink our conception about participation more broadly? I think the overall labor force participation rate for 16 and over, that has a downward trend. That downward trend is still continuing. That's a consequence of population aging. So if you're talking about the broadest measure of labor force participation, then you know I think we'll, we'll, we won't get back to the levels that we had prior to, to the pandemic. I think if you take, say, 25 to 54-year-olds, then over time, we may well get back to the sort of levels that we saw prior to the pandemic. Um, you know, whether it's labor force participation or employment to population ratios, that would be my expectation. And I think that is a reasonable, you know, sort of relatively untrended metric that you can use as an, as an indicator of, uh, of full employment. It's going to take a while because you know, of course, there are still significant numbers of people who are out of the workforce because of concerns around the pandemic. Obviously, that's going to get worse in the near term rather than better, at least as far as the employment reports are concerned. So the January report is probably going to see uh, a much more significant Omicron effect than the December report. Um, and then it may take a while before, before that, that fully normalizes. But over time, I, I would expect that to normalize. But it's going, you know, it's not going to be instantaneous and short run labor supply is probably still significantly below long term labor supply. And you need to manage both of those a little bit because, the, you know, if, if the long term takes a very long time to, to arrive, then what happens to inflation and what happens to, uh, you know, the economy more broadly, I think, is going to be affected by the short term measures as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I, I wanted to follow up on that point on what it all means for inflation as well, because, um, you know, for, for a while, I think people had a good idea as to the lowest level of unemployment that could be reached without kind of having to worry about it stoking inflation. And, and uh, that was uh, ripped up in the like later stages of the last cycle, um, in a way. And, but, and I'm wondering if some of the structural changes that um, you just alluded to, as well as, you know, what we're seeing on the inflation front does kind of upend the, the known relationship between unemployment and inflation. I think it's not that tight a relationship to begin with. I think there is a relationship, but the, your ability to sort of pin down, you know, a very precise Phillips curve and, a, and back out very precisely a, an unemployment rate that is that is sustainable in the in the long term. You know, I think that ability is relatively relatively limited, and I think the uncertainties are um, you know are sort of significant. They're even more significant once you go beyond the sort of narrow confines of the unemployment rate. But with that said, something a little bit south of four percent, you know, maybe in the three and a half to four percent range as the, the rate that is ultimately sustainable, that still, still seems, seems right. I mean, the Fed's estimate of the longer term unemployment rate, their conception in some sense of maybe the, the natural rate is, is 4%. We got to 3.5%. 3.5% seemed, seemed, seemed to be okay. I mean, we, we certainly had inflation in line with the target or a little bit below. So I think something in that range is probably still a, a reasonable estimate, but I, but I wouldn't say that that's, you know, whether it's a, a few tenths higher or a few tenths lower, that that is the only thing that matters or even necessarily the most important thing that matters for the, for the inflation outlook. There are broader labor market issues. And then there are also other issues that are maybe more prominent now than they seemed before the, before the pandemic and, and before this inflation surge of 2021 that, that, are, that are at least equally important. Mm -hmm. I definitely wanna, wanna focus a lot on inflation here, of course, I think like everyone else, but uh, quickly before getting to that point, just specifically on wage growth, because that's something that Fed officials have also said they're, they're paying quite a lot of attention to. And um, so far, you know, Chair Powell has said he hasn't really seen credible evidence that wage growth is contributing meaningfully to the overshoot in inflation that we have seen, but it obviously does play uh, a role here. And I'm wondering what kind of magnitude we do place on, on wage growth contributing to, to what we're seeing right now on the inflation front. 
I think from a backward looking perspective, I wouldn't disagree with that, that that's not been the main driver of, of inflation. In fact, I would, I would totally agree with that. It is important, I think, what, where we're going to settle out, assuming that the labor market you know, stays where it is or improves further, which I think is very likely, you know, what, what sort of wage growth rate is that consistent with? And you know, there, I think there, is a, there, there are a number of, there's, there's a pretty broad range again. If you, if you look at the current growth rate of wages, we have a wage tracker, which takes a number of different wage indicators, employment cost index, average hourly earnings, a few others, and we try to adjust that for changes in the composition of the, of the workforce. That tracker currently is running a little over 4% on a year-on-year basis, which would be fine. I mean, if you have 2% productivity growth, that means a little over 4%, you'd be a little over 2% for, for unit labor costs. That's broadly consistent with the 2% average inflation target. However, on a quarter on quarter annualized basis over the last few quarters, we've been running more like five and a half to 6%. And if, if that's where we settled, settled in, I think that would be more problematic because you'd have unit labor cost growth, you know, three and a half or, or 4%. And that probably is not going to be consistent. I mean, for a period of time, it might because the, the income distribution might you know, shift more in the in the direction of workers for for, for a while. That can that can certainly happen. Um, it'd be a drag on profit growth, but it uh, it wouldn't necessarily immediately lead to much higher inflation. But you know, over the longer term, I don't think that would be sustainable unless the productivity outlook, where I would say, if anything, we have reasonably upbeat views, is even more positive than than we're expecting. So you know, I think. The question is basically whether these recent numbers are more short-term in nature and maybe driven by some of the unusual fiscal support that we've seen to, uh, you know, to, to the household sector, maybe still an after effect of the uh, extended unemployment benefits, which obviously lapsed at the mm-hmm. end of the summer. Maybe there is a... Uh, a sort of effort by firms to uh, reward workers or, or retain workers uh, in an environment where, where quits are particularly high through sort of one-off payments. I think there is some evidence, um, certainly anecdotal evidence, that that's happening. Um, but if it, if it is more persistent and if six months down the road, the you know, year-on-year rates and the and the longer-term rates are all running north of five percent. Then I think that would be a concern, probably for for the for the Fed, and it would be a bigger issue for kind of the forward-looking inflation outlook. Mm-hmm, absolutely. Now, now talking uh, about that outlook here, I mean, how are you thinking about the trajectory for inflation with you know Omicron here, the fears about COVID becoming endemic? You have some of these supply chain issues and, and strong demand as well, all kind of coalescing um, this year. So, so how, how do you kind of see the trajectory over the next 12 months? Our forecast isn't that different from the forecast of the FOMC, which is, you know, they have 2.7% for core PCE inflation by the fourth quarter. I think that sounds pretty, pretty reasonable. The Fed staff actually has a a lower forecast, they're 2.1% um, for, for, for 2022 at the, at the end of the year, that um, you know, we're, we're a bit higher than that, more maybe closer to the, to the committee. There are a lot of cross currents. I think the main, the main one, the main impact though, is that the hugely positive impact of strength in the goods sector uh, that that is likely to abate as we go through 2022. Uh, right now, uh, year on year, the year on year change in, in goods prices, you know, is really unusually positive. We we focus on sort of eight supply constrained categories in the core PCE index. Right now, we're getting a positive impact of about 150 basis points. We think that probably goes to something like zero or maybe minus 50 basis points by late this year. 
early next year. So that takes away very substantially from the, from the current pace. And I think a lot of that shift is going to occur probably in the second quarter when the, the base effects, the year-on-year comparisons turn more benign from, a, from an inflation perspective because you're basically throwing out these big increases of mm-hmm. 2021. Um, so yeah, there's obviously uncertainty ar- around that. Um, but in, ter- in terms of the timing, but I think in terms of the ultimate impact, I'm very confident that we're going to start seeing a, a meaningful amount of relief. On the other side of the ledger, we have acceleration in, uh, in, in, in service prices and especially in, in rents. That's probably got quite a ways further to run, at least on a, on a year-on-year basis, where we've been printing much bigger rent increases in the CPI and the PCE index, mm-hmm. and that you know probably will continue. I think there are some early signs. If you look at new rents on new contracts, on, on new leases, there are some early signs of stabilization um, that's not going to be visible in the CPI or the PCE index probably for a while. But you know, as we go towards the end of the year, maybe that process will uh, will be will be completed. So I think. We'll, we'll probably still be above 2%. Uh, we'll still be significantly above 2% if you look at it on, a, on an average basis. The, the framework is average inflation targeting, so you still would be put, putting some weight on the very large inflation overshoot of 2021. Um, but I think the spot rate is going to be significantly south of the you know, 7% number for the headline CPI or sort of four and a half to 5% range for core PCE that we've been, that we, that we've been in. Mm-hmm, absolutely. So, so what does this all mean for the Fed then? I mean, we've, we've seen them over a matter of months pivot quite dramatically. I mean, it was just in September that officials and, and FOMC members were split on whether they will raise rates in 2022. Now we have you know, three expected um, as of December. And most recently, we've heard from various Fed officials that they'd be open to more than three um, just this month. So obviously, it's a, it's a shifting target here for the Fed. So I'm curious, you know, exactly how you're thinking about the trajectory going forward for the Fed. For 22, we're, we're looking for four hikes, so basically a hike at the at, at each uh, quarter in each quarter, March, June, September, December. I think March is pr- being pretty strongly signaled by what we've heard from Fed officials. I think subsequently, of course, it's going to depend on what we see in the in the data. Uh, you know, we don't have a hike currently at the at the May FOMC meeting, but it's certainly possible that if you get to May, they've lifted off and they have not yet started the, the balance sheet runoff and maybe aren't quite ready to do that yet, that there, there, there's going to be discussion of a hike uh, at consecutive meetings. I think it's an important decision to make not because 25 basis points more or less in May makes a, uh, makes a big difference, but really more because markets, if, you, if they did deliver hikes at consecutive meetings, probably would be building in a higher probability that that keeps happening, that they just keep going at a sort of uh, cadence of, of once every, every six weeks. And, and, and the market's not priced for that, right? The mar- market is priced for four hikes this year, but you know, something significantly um, faster, of course, would require probably more, more pricing of that that would have a bigger impact on financial conditions. No, maybe that's what is, is, is ultimately desirable. And that may very well be the decision that the committee comes to, but I think they would, they would need to think very carefully about it. Absolutely. Well, it's not just um, whether they hike in, in May or subsequent meetings. We're also hearing lots of speculation um, in the market, not not from Fed officials at all, but um, in terms of 50 basis point hike in March, which feels like quite aggressive from just given where we were just a couple months ago, um, as I alluded to earlier. So is that even remotely plausible in your mind or, or appropriate even given the economic outlook? 
I would be very surprised by that. I mean, even if you go back all the way to 1994, you know, a long ago tightening cycle that ultimately turned very aggressive with even a 75 basis point hike th thrown in there. The first hike was, was 25. I don't think there's any need to, to start off with a 50 basis point hike. And even further down the road, I don't think 50 basis, a 50 basis point hike is likely to be, to be necessary in an environment where there's a lot more communication about the entire path of the funds rate and where, you know, back in, in the sort of, uh, you know, prehistoric times of, of the 1990s when there was no forward guidance and until 1994, they didn't even tell people whether they had actually moved the funds rate target, mm -hmm. uh, but that was something that market participants had to figure out for, for themselves. You know, back then, you know, I think if you, if you wanted to be a lot more hawkish, you basically had to deliver a bigger hike at, the, at that meeting because you know, there was no real tool set for communicating subsequent policy. Nowadays, you have the summary of economic projections, you have a lot more communication uh, from from the chair and from from others, so I don't think it's likely to be necessary. The question is really more: Do you see, you know, maybe a string of hikes at at at, at subsequent at, at successive meetings? And I think that is a possibility, but again, needs to be thought about carefully. Right, for sure. Um, now, I mean, if we if we do get kind of the inflation outlook that you that you laid out for us earlier panning out here. Um, does that at all, and, and then in terms of how that relates to kind of the growth outlook as well in the U.S., I mean, does that all at all impact, you think, how the Fed proceeds from here? Because would they maybe shy away from being more aggressive if we're entering a period of, of much more moderate economic growth, as is, you know, to be expected after the year that, that we just had? Um, or is there, an, you know, sufficient momentum here uh, to have above trend growth in the U.S.? so that it kind of justifies the Fed's more aggressive approach. I mean, it's practically a given that it's going to be uh, slower than last year. Last year was obviously extremely fast, you know, close, close to 6%. Um, I think the question is really, yeah, how much more above trend growth do you want to see if you're already at a point where full employment is not that far away. Maybe, maybe you're already there, maybe you're close. Inflation is well above the target. And yeah, our, our forecast is a little bit below the consensus actually, unlike a year ago when we were strongly above consensus for, for growth. We're looking for you know, basically, well, 3.3% for the annual average, but that's actually only 2.4% on a fourth quarter to fourth quarter basis. So that's the basis on which the FOMC reports their expectations. We, 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 we think that's you know, only six or seven tenths of a percentage point above the, uh, above, above the economy's underlying trend. Drivers here are, I, I would say first and foremost, really the fiscal retrenchment and the fact that there are no more tax rebates there are no more extended unemployment benefits, and there probably isn't going to be a child tax credit as generous as in 2021. All of those things are, are likely to weigh on household income and, and especially on consumer spending growth. Uh, that's, that's the main driver. And then the other question is what happens to financial conditions? Mm -hmm. And I think at a minimum, the positive impulse from the easing of financial conditions that we saw until about six months ago, that positive impulse is going away. And you know, how much more tightening of financial conditions we get on top of that, I think to a large extent is going to depend, of course, on what Fed policy does. I mean, the market, um, the financial markets more, more broadly have absorbed the pricing of four, four rate hikes relatively easily. We've seen some tightening, but nothing, nothing major. If they were to signal a significantly more aggressive path, that probably would mean more tightening. And that may be appropriate if you decide you actually do need to get back to more of a trend growth pace. But that's, that's sort of the, the question. 
One thing I didn't talk about uh, is Omicron. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's obviously also a factor in the short term. I think it's an important factor for the employment numbers in the, in the short term. First quarter GDP, I think first quarter GDP is likely to look pretty soft. But I, we are assuming that that impact is basically behind us by the end of the first quarter. And you know, Q2 should then see some degree of, some degree of recovery uh, as far as the pandemic impact is concerned. But of course, that continues to be a wild card as mm -hmm. you go further out into the year. Could, you know, unfortunately be that we see another variant with a bigger economic impact. And of course, that's something that monetary policy also needs to be prepared for. Mm -hmm, absolutely. Are, are you of the view that, you know, subsequent waves of COVID are going to be most pronounced on the inflation outlook in terms of the impact because of the supply chain um, issues and, and, you know, this, this preference for good spending over services spending, uh, exacerbating things? Or, I mean, we, we've learned a lot, I guess, in subsequent waves of COVID, how the economy uh, responds, but, but we, do, we know well that each wave is, is quite different. Yeah, I think it's hard to know. I mean, wh whether it's going to be a, it would be an inflationary development if we had another another wave. I mean, there are offsetting effects on the goods side and the and the service side. On the, you know, on the goods side, you would you would very likely get at least some additional supply effects and therefore higher prices. On the other hand, services. You know, restaurants, uh, hotels, etc., air travel. That would probably be a, a negative, and and it's. It, I think it's. I, I think it's a bit hard to say. In general, I think though that the strength of goods inflation, a large part of that, is not directly the supply disruptions, but just the strength of demand. Mm -hmm. I mean, goods demand has been extremely strong. And to a large extent, it's been driven by strong household income because of, in part, because of the fiscal support and then the shift of spending from services into, into goods. As we go through 2022, I think both of those effects are likely to uh, diminish. And the first one, the first one almost certainly, the second one Again, depending on what happens, uh, what happens with the virus. But, but you know, my bottom line for me is that the goods, the upward pressure on on goods prices, most of that is probably behind us, and I would expect more of a sideways move in terms of the level of prices this year, uh, maybe some declines, and then a much more substantial decline in the inflation rate, i.e., the year-on-year -year change in in prices. Yeah, great. Um... So we can we have a couple of audience questions now um, that that uh, take us uh, really ac across a wide spectrum of, of topics here. So um, I'll start with the first one, which is on China. Um, the question is, you know, what are the thoughts on on China's economic rise compared to the U.S.'s uh, trajectory here? So maybe within the con we can talk about that in the context of of today and uh, some of the growth struggles there and and whether. Perhaps we also will see a, a rebound in 2021. I think that's that's helpful um, to know. Well, our expectation for China growth is a, a little below the consensus. We have a we have a more cautious view. We're at four and a half percent for annual average growth. Consensus is a little over five, and the the drivers of weaker growth are number one: the property market is still a negative property was a strong positive contributor to growth for the last 10 years or more and that seems to have shifted we're not expecting a you know anything like a lehman moment mm -hmm. um, we do think it's going to continue to be a sort of managed property slowdown but nevertheless i think the real economic impact is going to be negative in 2022 and beyond and then number two, the costs of the zero COVID policy in terms of growth are increasing. We are not expecting a change to the zero COVID policy uh, for in, in 2022, and you know, at least not until maybe late in the year. But it is becoming more costly to try to keep 
keep infections close to zero in an environment where you have such a transmissible variant and the vaccines don't pro provide that much, uh, that, that much protection against infection in, in particular. So all of that, I think, is going to weigh on growth. We'll see additional lockdowns. And we therefore have, especially the first quarter, pretty soft. Um, subsequently, perhaps a you know some degree of recovery, but that does hinge on the the, the lockdowns at least stabilizing. There is one factor that I think points to some strength that offsets part of the first two, which is that macro policy in China has now turned more clearly expansionary. That was something that we'd been expecting for a while and it kind of kept not happening for most of 2021 but towards the very end of the year and early this year the authorities have moved both on fiscal policy and on monetary policy and on lending policy uh toward in a, in a more expansionary direction but we think it's only going to be a partial uh you know a partial offset mm -hmm. um before i turn to the next question just a reminder to our audience that you can submit your own um, through uh, by, by going to ccga.live, um, typing that into your browser and then following the on-screen prompts. Um, our next question kind of uh, asks, uh, you know, a similar one to, to China, but in the context of the U.S. here and the Biden administration and its policies. And uh, uh, there's obviously been, um, you know, quite a lot of uh, discussion about the impact of the emergency COVID packages on the economy. Um, you have the Biden administration also, you know, embarking on um, two extremely large spending packages that that seek to, uh, you know, quell inflation and, and deal with some of these long term structural issues that the economy is, is saddled with here. Um, and and the, the question kind of speaks to, you know, what more can the Biden administration do? What could it have done differently, perhaps? From a policy point of view, um, to to perhaps uh, you know get us to a, a more stable kind of growth outlook in a way to deal more um, uh, directly with inflation. Is there anything from the policy point of view that you think would be effective here? Well, I mean, from a backward-looking perspective, you know, they clearly came in with a very strong desire to not repeat the mistakes of the early post-08 period when, you know, fiscal policy was sort of underpowered. There was a stimulus package, but it was underpowered. Monetary policy was underpowered. QE was halting and ultimately not very, very effective. And partly as a consequence, we spent a very long time before we started getting back to really, uh, you know, much better employment levels. And they they were very determined not to make that mistake, and they managed to pass a very large large package, which you know was one key driver of the upward the excess demand of for for, for goods, and therefore the increase in uh, in inflation. So that's that's very clear. You know, I think where we go from here, our expectation is that from a macroeconomic perspective, probably not that much else happens in 2022. There may still be a version of Build Back Better or a longer term fiscal plan that can pass. There are some areas of agreement between, uh, between President Biden, the administration, and senators mansion and, and cinema so i think there's there's still a decent a decent possibility that uh, that some of this will pass what probably won't pass is the, the 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 parts of that package that would have been most macroeconomically uh important in terms of the near term growth outlook which was really the the child tax credit that's why we took down our our near term growth growth mm -hmm. estimates and uh, yeah, I think that is unlikely to pass just given the reporting on where, where, where people are and where, where Senator Manchin has uh, kind of staked out his, his views. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, I'm going to combine a couple of questions here. We, we have one from the audience that, that focuses on the kind of surplus uh, cash and excess savings on household balance sheets and, and what the impact has been on the, the U.S. economy, whether that's 
uh, been, uh, you know, a huge benefit or actually creating some kind of imbalances in the economy. Um, and then second to that point, um, we have a question on what sectors of the economy are, are likely to recover the fastest from here on out and, and where there might be um, some laggards. As, as far as the first one's concerned, uh, there is a significant amount of pent up savings on household balance sheets, close to two and a half trillion dollars, which you can basically calculate as the saving rate since March 2020 relative to a normal saving rate and then effectively accumulate the dollars. That's what we, what we come up with. That's a reason, I think, to expect that the fiscal drag in 2022 is not going to have as large an impact, as large a negative impact as a sort of naive, simple calculation would suggest. If you simply kind of calculate a mechanical fiscal impulse measure, you'd get a huge negative impulse mm -hmm. in 2022. I think that's too negative because I, I am assuming that a significant part of it is going to be offset by uh, pent up saving being spent down. And by the way, we're not assuming that anything close to 100% of it is going to be spent. We're assuming sort of 20 to 30% is going to be spent in the next, in the next year or two. But that is, is, is sufficient, I think, to, to offset some of this. Now, from a policy perspective, if you had delivered some of these you know, benefits to, to households in, more, in a more spread out form, over a period, you know, maybe starting in 2020 and then only drawing down gradually through 2022, but with less of a of a, of a boost uh, early on, that that probably would have resulted in a little bit less volatility mm -hmm. than what we're what we're seeing now. But but that that would be the main um, sort of economic implication of the of the pent up savings. In terms of sectors, I think for you know. Parts of the economy are already above the pre-pandemic trend. I mean, household goods spending is well above the, the pre-pandemic trend. Household services spending is still far below the pre-pandemic trend. I think that is going to, uh, you know, going to rebalance to a, to a significant degree. I don't think that process will be done by the end of the year, but we'll have a lot more, on, a lot more growth, I think, in service spending than in goods spending, maybe outright declines in goods spending. Overall consumption, I don't think it's going to be particularly strong. I think it's, it, it'll grow at a, at a relatively slow pace. Mm -hmm. Business investment looks like it's going to outperform relative to uh, household spending. And we're, we're seeing that in the, in the data, in the macroeconomic data. We're also seeing it in capital spending intentions by, by businesses from a, mm -hmm. a bottom-up perspective in their, in their reports to shareholders. And then housing, you know, I think is probably going to you know, go more sideways at, at pretty strong levels, maybe, maybe still up somewhat. The, the issue on, on housing is to a large extent also supply constraints, supply of land, supply of labor. Demand is very strong and that probably will taper off somewhat as mortgage rates rise. So if you just looked at what, how demand is going to evolve, you'd probably say housing should weaken as you go through 2022, but it's not so clear if a lot of the uh, constraint on the level of activity is actually more on the supply side and those constraints diminish somewhat. Right, right. Uh, as a follow on to that, we, we have a question about um, the Fed here and its uh, ability to actually control inflation at this point. And I think a lot of people point to the fact that they, they constantly say, you know, they can't do much about the supply chain issues. But, but you've alluded to the fact that there is a real kind of demand component here in the inflation, um, with the inflation situation we're, we're grappling with. So um, do you think the Fed actually has the ability to, to really kind of control inflation at this point? Well, I don't think they ever have the, the ability to control inflation in a very near term sense. I mean, there are so many other factors and the, the you know, the Fed is really only one and it takes a while before, you know, Fed policy filters through into, uh, you know, into the impulse to growth that, that basically depends on what happens to financial conditions. 
and then there is a lag between the growth side or the real, real activity side and, and what happens to inflation. I do think that if you look two, two years forward, certainly if you look five years forward, Fed policy is going to be the most important driver of, of inflation. They're going to be able to put the inflation rate effectively where, where they want it to be in the, in the long term. Now, maybe with uh, you know, bigger or smaller, a bigger or smaller price that needs to be paid in terms of economic activity, but, but their, their ability to control inflation from a long-term perspective is very, very significant but not so much in the short term. Okay. We have time for, for one more question and we've gotten several on cryptocurrencies and, and I don't know to what extent you're, you want to engage on, on some of these issues, but um, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll send them over to you so you can uh, attempt here. So we have a couple um, on whether the crypto uh, market is in a bubble and what you know, the state of crypto prices and innovation in that space suggests about the broader economy. And then, um, you know, one final one on, is this the year that crypto goes mainstream? I'm afraid I don't really have a, have a strong, strong view on that. I certainly don't have a price target. And, uh, you know, clearly it's something that a lot of people follow. And uh, there are, you know, a number of discussions that we are more into the economics and monetary policy area when it comes to central bank digital currencies versus you know stable coins i mean that the payments innovation is an is an important question and how central banks should approach this whether they should uh, introduce their own uh, their own central bank digital currency which is really a direct claim on by non-banks, by uh, you know non-financial households or or businesses on the central bank, or whether they should primarily focus on regulating stablecoin, um, and this is a debate that still continues. The U.S. I think is going to be rel- relatively slow in mm. introducing a central bank digital currency. It could happen, but I think if it happens, it's going to be in in in, in sort of slow increments. Uh, but as far as cryptocurrencies are concerned, I'm I'm afraid I have less of a uh, less of a view to to share. Certainly not on price targets. Uh, just just I, I figured as much. Um, but just just one last question for you on this whole notion of the central bank um, uh, digital currency here. I mean, when you do think about the the impact on monetary policy and, and the transmission there into the broader economy. You know what? What implications feel most relevant and important to you that, that we all should be paying close attention to? I think it depends on how aggressive any move to a central bank digital currency would be. I don't think it would be very aggressive. I I think the the Fed and other central banks are going to be careful not to disintermediate the the banking system. So digital a digital currency. Central bank digital currency would, um, you know, would coexist alongside the sort of traditional, uh, tra- traditional financial system, and then it also wouldn't have a large impact on on monetary policy. The, I think a lot of people are confused about the term central bank digital currency because ninety percent or so of M two is already digital, mm-hmm. so it's not that that it's a digital currency. That's not really the main thing. The main thing is that uh, CBDC means a direct claim on the central bank by households and non-financial businesses. And you know, I think there is room for introducing that cautiously, but you're not going to anytime soon, I think, replace the sort of core uh, you know, bank, uh, centered system of of financial intermediation. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, unfortunately, we have to leave it there. This has been such a great uh, wine raging discussion. So Jan, thank you so much uh, for taking the time. This has been uh, wonderful. So appreciate it. Thank you very much, Colby. Uh, And uh, thank you very much to the the council. It's been, uh, been a fascinating discussion and we could certainly carry this on for uh, quite a while longer, but we have to stop I here. I know, I feel the same way. Um, and just a reminder to, to the audience members, we'll, we'll have a recording of this conversation available 
um, for playback soon on the council's social uh, channels as well as its website. Um, but thank you all again for, for joining us and, and Jan as well for participating in the debate.